we would like to hear now from Colin Singer about the visa schemes or the immigration programs that are specifically designed for rural areas and how they contribute to rural development in Canada. Good morning, everyone. Um, a headline in today's New York Times titled A Long Cycle uh, speaks about the global migration wave of the 21st century uh, being without uh, precedent. Um, of course, in North America, Europe and Oceania, uh, the share of the foreign born population is at unprecedented historic uh, high levels. Uh, oddly enough, that article does not refer to Canada, which is a leader in uh, per capita based immigration. Uh, currently, the uh, leading uh, country with the most foreign born uh, population share is Australia, which is uh, over 30 percent. And Canada is second uh, and growing at 23.5 percent. Um, the challenge, uh, as everyone knows, well, more importantly on demographics, the 85 percent of Canada's population lives within 100 miles of the Canada-US border. And more uh, uh, strikingly, the largest share of immigrants uh, goes and, and, and settles uh, in the uh, greater Toronto area where 60% of migrants move, uh, followed by Vancouver <clears throat> and, sorry, and Montreal. Uh, so those three cities are the source uh, destinations for, for migrants to Canada. Um, and of course, we talk about housing as a challenge. Um, <clears throat> sorry, but uh, one of the other challenges, which is very problematic in Canada, is finding a family physician. And uh, immigration.ca, we bring in uh, many, many family physicians from certain source countries. Uh, and even there, there's the wait lists to find a family physician is, is very shocking in, in some of the um, jurisdictions within Toronto, for example, uh, where I'm sitting. So you have a housing shortage, you have a rental prices that are skyrocketing since COVID. And the challenge with policy make for challenge, the challenge for policymakers in Canada is how to entice immigrants, newcomers uh, to move outside these Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary area. And what I will show today and speak about today is some of the success stories uh, where some of these jurisdictions outside these source areas, these destination, these preferred destination areas, are succeeding, but I have to say, uh, from a business point of view, and I've yet to see compelling demographic uh, studies that show what is the cost of acquisition that a smaller jurisdiction must pay uh, to entice immigrants to these areas. And I think a part of the challenge that I would highly encourage governments and policymakers to look at is from an economic point of view, is how to um, look at this as a business a cost of acquisition and, and look at it in ways that will entice people. And unfortunately, if anyone starts a business, you know when you have no followers and, and no traffic, uh, you are spending much more than maybe years later when you have a following, you have a brand name. And so these smaller cities, uh, unfortunately, have to look at a very large cost of acquisition. And uh, I will be able to speak today and show you some of the success stories, uh, although modest in terms of the 465,000 newcomers coming to Canada each year, um, there are some bright lights that policymakers can take great pride in and perhaps uh, build on uh, moving forward. We will move on to the next discussion round, which is about the requirements and the policy design of place-based visa schemes and the matching of immigrants and communities. So in this round, we will start with Colin Singer. In Canada, there are 
quite some different immigration programs uh, to foster rural development. So maybe you can name a few or all of them, but uh, maybe you could highlight the rural and northern immigration pilot in your contribution. So the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, Christiane. Uh, so in Canada, there's shared jurisdiction in immigration. You have the federal government uh, being the largest stakeholder in driving immigration to Canada. And uh, concurrently with that, the provinces each have a say in uh, newcomers that uh, are selected to settle in, in each of the various provinces. Uh, the uh, trend over over the past six, seven years, really it's only about six, seven years, where the federal government designed programs that are really aimed at driving newcomers to the smaller jurisdictions which face a number of challenges that we all know about. Um, and parallel to that, each of the provinces have various forms of settlement uh, selection uh, programs that are, are geared to drive uh, newcomers to the outlying areas. Um, and some of them are business-based. For example, in Ontario, under the Entrepreneur uh, Success Initiative, which is an Ontario immigration nominee program, uh, individuals can, can vie to, to be uh, candidates as long as they're projecting to live outside the greater Toronto area. But federally, uh, there are these programs which uh, it, known you know, as some of them were pilot projects and have become permanent due to their success measured by very small, uh, in the global sense, very small success in terms of population increase. All these programs are employment based. Uh, all these programs are based on an employer coming forward and extending a, 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 an approved offer of employment and matching that candidate uh, with um, the uh, particular program allocation. Uh, the Atlantic Immigration Program was the first on the list. Uh, it came out uh, as a pilot project probably around 2016, 2017. Uh, the numbers coming into the Atlantic pilot project allocation wise uh, in 2022, there's only 6,250 uh, that are uh, being targeted, uh, that were targeted, I should say. And this year, that number has grown to 8,500. In 2024, it's going to be 11,500. And in two years' time, it will be 14,500, where the federal government. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, allow for individuals going to the Atlantic provinces, uh, only, only four provinces, as it's a really small part of the country. Um, you have another program, which is ca called a pilot rural immigration program, uh, the Agri-Food Pilot Program. Um, these projects, uh, really from 2022, the, the volume of candidates, again, employment-based, the numbers were 10,250, and in 2025, it'll grow to 14,750. Um, and so those are the larger programs, what I call large, but 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 pale uh, compared to um, what exists on the federal side. Um, within the rural um, immigration program, you have about 22 communities that have been accepted uh, some of them, a large, lot of them are in, 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 in Ontario, Sudbury, North Bay, Timmins, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Thunder Bay. And then you have uh, one in BC, uh, one in Manitoba, and one in Saskatchewan. Um, again, they uh, are all employment-based. Some of them uh, have these criteria that are very occupation-based, uh, geared to finding uh, candidates uh, with very specific skill sets um, but ultimately, uh, any of these communities that participate where you have a selection, where you have a, a letter of support or an employer support, um, these are the, the bellwether uh, criterion uh, that, that you need uh, in addition to the other criteria, whether it's education, employment, um, experience. Uh, of course, language is critical. Uh, you need to have minimal language requirements. Uh, and then there's scores and point-based uh, that all are, uh, you know, juggled together 
um, to produce a, a selection decision. Um, so those are the, the main programs. Uh, obviously, the title of agri-food pilot is pretty self-explanatory. It's all in the uh, meat produce uh, area of the country uh, that are found in, um, in Manitoba. Uh, so these are really, really specific candidates that are being sought after um, in the farming industry. Uh, and, and for some of these programs, the areas of the country that uh, are facing challenges, shrinking communities and such, uh, these are the reasons for, for these very targeted programs, which account for, in the global sense, a very small percentage of the 465,000 newcomers coming to Canada. So that's just a general overview of the types of programs. Alongside the provincial programs, there's four or five very specific um, uh, of these um, city employment uh, based uh, attracting newcomers to what we call small communities in Canada. So thanks for this round and we will start with the next round where we will talk about what do the places, the communities or the visa schemes offer to immigrants. So we will start with uh, Colin. So please, Colin, um, let share your insights on the Canadian case, and uh, please especially um, share your insights on the RNIP with us. Thank you. Okay. So part of the challenge that Canadian policymakers uh, have faced in the past is the uh, constitutional rights that newcomers have and all Canadians have under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is the Section 6, uh, which is freedom of mobility, and, and courts have, have interpreted freedom of mobility to primarily be work-related. Um, and so it's quite clear that uh, newcomers to Canada um, are primarily, first and foremost, uh, concerned about being able to find employment. And so where you have either, if it were not employment-based, it would be uh, civil status, maybe someone's being sponsored under a marriage regime. Um, but if it's not civil status regime marriage sponsorship, you're looking at economic programs and, and clearly uh, candidates coming, newcomers coming to Canada uh, are focused on first and foremost finding work. And so initially these programs are have, have traditionally these programs that are in the smaller communities, these, uh, these new programs that we're all talking about today, first and foremost, it's like an onion layer. Uh, they, they first focus on the low skilled immigration uh, sector. Um, whether it's hospitality, whether it's farming, um, uh, the um, building trades, uh, construction, and uh, the, the standard types of lower skilled uh, are first and foremost uh, uh, what has drawn uh, interest uh, from these, these different programs. But over time, these programs start to be able to have enough, uh, enough traction and, and then they are able to start garnering interest from employers in the higher skilled, whether it's software engineers uh, and, and uh, systems analysts and um, uh, engineering types. So these programs start to evolve into mainstream, but they're still not mainstream. Um, so uh, in, in, in answer to Kenan's uh, first thoughts, um, the challenges that employers in the United States may face is the timing of, of when can they get to the employer. And what we see in Canada these days is, uh, is that the government uh, has really taken a, a very marked change in uh, removing barriers to visitor visas. Uh, for some countries, and surprisingly, some of these countries have historically had large barriers and you needed, you know, a temporary entry visas to get to Canada. Uh, and now countries like the Philippines, uh, you don't need a visitor visa. You, 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 you don't need permission uh, to visit. Well, you still need to register and, and get a, uh, a, you know, a, a, a very simple visa just to travel. 
Um, but the government has kind of opened the doors to certain countries. Um, and it's for some people, this is troubling. Uh, for some people, this is 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 uh, it, it, it points to the the difficulties that Canadian permanent residents and newcomers will face in finding housing and finding medical uh, help, uh, finding family doctors, as I alluded to very early. Um, but uh, the 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 first and foremost is getting the employer matched and then having this person this candidate get to the employer fairly quickly. So these initial approval stages generally are are uh, done in, in fairly quick time. Um, but then it's the visa office that has to get these people sorted. And with people in Canada already on visitor status and the volumes of visitor status we're going to see as we move forward, we'll have historical perspective and see that these are quite different times in terms of the the numbers of visitors to Canada uh, that that we will be able to uh, point to. But by having them in place, and we always encourage uh, applicants to Canada, it's very difficult to navigate all of this from your from your you know your 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 computer screen. Uh, and if you actually are telling an employer, look, I'm here to meet you face to face because some of the uh, some of these employment based opportunities, uh, some employers do want to know that an, a candidate can start quickly, fairly quickly, and not have to wait three to six to a year's waiting time. It's not tenable to make an employer wait six to 12 months to get a candidate. It's, it's just not tenable. Um, but if you uh, allow individuals the opportunity to travel, and I do believe moving forward, if the government were to introduce some of the um, be straight out and be transparent and say, you know, to a visitor prospectively, look, I want to visit Canada because I want to find a job and work in your country. I know there's lots of opportunities and they put on the table their credentials and they get all that pre-screened up front uh, so that half the battle, half the verification, half the due diligence is already is already completed. And then it's just making sure that the employer has the tax ability, has the financial ability to hire and has the the metrics to to meet on the employer hiring side, you would shorten uh, the hiring process tremendously. You'd have people in Canada already here. They've declared their intentions because, of course, this this previous notion, you if you appear and you smell and you look like you're going to be there permanently, you're not leaving. That's a no, no. We're going to decline you right away. Uh, so it's this kind of balance where you kind of declare right up front. I intend to work in your country. These are my credentials. I have the qualifications to meet with uh, various smaller community programs. Um, so I think uh, moving forward, um, I think uh, fine tuning this process by allowing visitors into the country who have the right credentials and who can get sorted out uh, from a selection perspective and and that will that will shorten the time frames and it will also it will also reduce the burden that visa offices face because you're moving you're moving from a visa office which has limited resources across many silos uh, you can you can ch change your visa status inside Canada and that's a new trend that has that has opened up in the last two years post COVID so um, I. I, I encourage policymakers to look uh, at this possibility of allowing visitors to Canada declare uh, their intention right off the bat and allow these intending immigrants um, to to produce all of the documentation that will reduce the processing times for employers. And I think that will could could work well for uh, you know the Heartline project. Uh, and for sure in Canada, I, I do believe this is a solution that should be very carefully looked at. Uh, Christian, did I, uh, did you want me to cover particularly the rural, uh, the rural program? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite straightforward on my presentation, um, but I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if you want, I can speak about the qualifications of the uh, rural and northern immigration, which is a pilot project, by the way. Uh, 
I can share this if you. So you as want you, to show yeah, go one back. of these slides, this let's, one? Let's stay on that slide, sure. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so just from a point of view, you see the participating communities, um, and I believe there's 22. Uh, and if you just look at the, uh, I'm interested in the, uh, the numbers of, take a look at the numbers that each particular community, and it's, it, it's not that, it's it, it it's not that you know, the the percentage wise is interesting but the numerical numbers are not that compelling but it just points to the difficulties that some of these smaller communities have in growing their population um but there is there is significant success from year to year you're growing a population north bay uh from you know 70 uh, 73000 in, in a four year period going to 77,000. These are really small communities. And I, I do wanna point out uh, the, the concept, there's a distinction that I'd like to make between remote versus smaller communities. You're not asking people to go and live in remote areas. That, that sounds daunting and challenging in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the best of scenarios. Uh, in encouraging someone to go live in a remote area, I, I do believe that's very challenging. And how do you entice people? If you look back in the immigration uh, channels from years ago, um, government of Canada used to offer free land uh, to populate some of these these tracts of, of re, you know, in the heartlands of Canada. Um, and if you were to, and that was very successful. And if necessary, uh, and I think that is a question of when policymakers need to acknowledge, have they arrived at that for some of the smaller communities? There can be provincial tax credits that are offered to newcomers who settle in some of these smaller communities. As I alluded to earlier, the cost of acquisition of a newcomer is very, very significant compared to someone like Toronto. They don't have to offer any benefits. In fact, they need to encourage people to move outside the greater Toronto area. So offering tax credits from a provincial point of view, and that would be largely a provincial uh, play uh, versus, a, I mean, the federal could, could look at that as well, but I think largely a provincial tax credit would be um, a, a, a method to to add to the selection and to the enticement tool. But uh, having community infrastructure, um, uh, housing is obviously much less costly for a newcomer. And for these are the metrics that people look at. So A, if they have an employment opportunity, um, the cost, the wages are going to be lower, but the cost of living is going to be lower. And all of the selection models in Canada First and foremost, the wages have to be the average median wage for that occupation in that local community. So obviously, uh, a software engineer is going to earn $150,000 as the median wage in Toronto. Uh, that particular salary might be only $92,000 uh, in, in an outlying area. And, and for that, someone has to be able to look at what will $92,000 buy in terms of quality of life. These are the tools that um, provincial communities need to be able to offer a wage of a, a range of, of occupations um, to newcomers uh, and show them that their net earnings uh, plus tax credits are, are very enticing. Uh, and, and I think that's the way forward. First, as I mentioned before, reducing barriers for people to come and visit Canada, allowing in, in, potential candidates to be available to start in the near term. Uh, and parallel to that, the employers are offering competitive wages and the community itself offers by itself uh, very attractive living conditions. Again, I'm not referring to remote areas. I'm just referring to smaller communities. Those are my general thoughts. Thank you so much, Colin.